Hell's Angels. Maybe the name started with a movie, or a little later, with a World War II bomber squadron operating out of England. When that war was finally over, some of the old crew members returned home to Southern California, where they worked factories and steel mills by day and customized motorcycles by night. Civilian life was pretty dull after the air wars of Europe, and one way of escaping the boredom were weekend runs on those newly chopped Harleys, where the squadron's memory could live on. But first, there was some serious 4th of July racing in a dusty farm town called Hollister. Peace, but not quiet, was restored to Hollister, California today after 36 hours of turmoil created by close to 750 visiting motorcyclists, many of them unemployed returning servicemen. Police said the motorcyclists turned the city's main street into a speed and stunt area as others roared through this little central California Valley town of 4,800 people. 32 special officers were called to help the seven-man city force quell the disturbance. At least 50 persons have been injured and 38 arrests have been made. Authorities estimated the invaders numbered close to 4,000, all part of a three-day so-called gypsy tour, flat race and hill climb motorcycle event. Trouble started late Friday when cyclists all but took over the town. A hopeful city councilman told this reporter that the caravan is expected to depart Those today. Those few days in Hollister caught the whole country's attention. Six years later, in 1953, Stanley Kramer made a movie about that now infamous weekend and brought the first motorcycle outlaw to Hollywood. Now hit the road. I mean, right now, get going. We want to watch the thrilling races, Daddy. <laughs> One more cute remark and you won't be riding any sickles. Where are you going when you leave here? Now listen, you don't go any one special place. That's cornball style. You just go. <laughs> Movies. Like a lot of us, this is where we got our first impressions about the Hell's Angels. But it wasn't until January of 1981, on a cool San Francisco night, we happened to meet a Hell's Angel who'd been in the club since the early 60s. Later that evening, he told us that the Angels had been working for years on a real motorcycle movie. And this time, they were going to tell their own story their own way. Between a man and a boy Is his taste of good whiskey And the price of his toy I've known all along now That I'd never fit in the Backyard get-togethers With their tawny guarantee Well, I'm an angel on the highway if I care, do it my way. I'm an angel living for today. I'll be living fast till the day that I die. Loving life and all the ways till I'll try. Well, I'm loved by my brothers. I'm hated by some others. Criticize for everything I do, don't do. But one thing's for certain, before they pull that final curtain, I'm gonna make them all believers if it's the last thing I do. Possibly 
Greek or Roman warrior societies, which were based on honor and bravery. I like living in an honored society, a society where I can turn around and trust whoever I'm with. And Hell's Angels is the only place I've seen it. We live amongst our own law. We don't go, we don't care about society, you know what I'm saying? We don't care about nobody but ourselves. They ain't a man alive at one time or another was wish he was a Hell's Angel. I don't care whether he's a lawyer, judge, preacher, or what. Somewhere along the line, he's always wanted to be a Hell's Angel. We discovered that this movie started with a Hell's Angel by the name of Sandy Alexander, and we went back east to meet him. But to see Sandy, who's president of the club's New York City chapter, you have to meet a Manhattan that isn't exactly skyscrapers in Park Avenue. Sandy's New York is on the edge of the Bowery, 3rd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues. It's an old immigrant neighborhood where Sandy says a lot of working class people still live. Here, right where all the countries are totally against the United States, but here are all the little people, not, you know, statuses like the, the presidents and the legislature and all that which hate us, but the little people, right, all want to be Hell's Angels. And Hell's Angels are American, and Hell's Angels are our way of life. American way of life. The first meeting that I ever went to, right, I'd seen this guy Clay Wilson that I did, right, and uh, he had a, a Hell's Angel patch on. And I says, oh, man, the uh, one of the Hell's Angels come around Santa Rosa. He said, well, we got a charter now. I told him, I said, well, why don't you take me to Mino and join the club, right? And he said, yeah, okay, sure. His early prospects just walked off, right? Yeah. And so it's like, that that next week, it was like I went out and found out where he lived, and I knocked on his fucking door, right? You know, and I said, hey, here I am, take me to the meeting, you know, and he goes, uh -huh. you know. So we get to the fucking meeting, right? He walks in, right? Sits down at the table, pulls a fucking gun out, right? Cocks it, sticks it in this guy's face, and says, You're not the president. Anymore. I am. <laughs> Take your patch off. <laughs> you know? And who are you with? <laughs> oh. yeah. Yeah. I'm the mailman. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then he goes, You, you can stay. You, take it off. You, you're all right. And he gets around to me, right? Here I am, a stranger. He's never seen me before in his life, right? And I'm standing in the fucking room and this is going on. You know what I mean? And when I look, that fucking gun looked that big. That's the meanest motherfucker I ever seen in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, seen him I was like this. I was scared. I really was scared. And he says, who in the fuck are you and what are you doing here? And I went, <laughs> I pushed myself away from the wall and said, my name is Rick. I want to join your club. I think Hell's Angels are born. I don't, I don't think they're made. There's always one youngster in every class that is really a hell's angel. He, uh, he's different from the rest. He, he's a little rowdier, he's a little more aggressive, he's uh, a little more honest, and he's a little harder to convince. He's a little harder to cram bullshit down his throat. And as he gets older, he gets harder and harder to cram bullshit down his throat. And, uh, he comes and sees me and my friends and finds out that uh, that's where he belongs. I got up Marines in 66, you know, I uh, started hanging out with uh, guys in the Bronx that rode. And uh, I guess right out of Marines, I guess I was just ready for a brotherhood trip, you know what I'm saying? Because Marine Corps, you know, teaches my brotherhood, you know what I'm saying? They brought me down here, they introduced me to Sandy, I became his prospect, I prospected him for him. Family nomads, and the night, the night he got shot, I was a prospect, and I, and I went to the guy who had the gun, and I got voted the next day, you know? to say about foreign sports cars. And I don't drink imported beer down at my favorite bar. Just give me a corn dog on a stick or you can shove your caviar. Shit kicking all around American boy. That's just what I Between these thighs, give me a Harley. Man will fly. What do you say? Let's ride. 
see a jap piece of shit between these thighs. Give me a Harley. Man, we'll fly. What do you say? The reason why Hells Angels grew has been by its leadership that summer. His vision came true, and we spread all the way, not only from California, clear across the United States, but into, you know, into Europe, a different world. Everybody wants to be home. I may never get by the angels of my friends. You don't know what damn thing stoking the fire. By the early 1970s, Almost everyone wearing a badge had declared open season on the Hells Angels. The brothers were used to being harassed, but something else was up. It was the start of an organized campaign that seven years later would give the club the biggest fight of its life. October 31st, 1972. California Attorney General Evel J. Younger today issued what he called a far-reaching report on organized crime in California. While noting criminal activity ranging from Chinese street gangs to bookmaking, Younger called for vigilance against the Hells Angels, who he claimed are rapidly becoming large-scale organized crime operators. Younger also suggested that lawmen intensify their efforts to put club leader Sonny Barger behind bars. And they got Sonny Barger, all right, on small-time drug charges that earned him a long stretch in Folsom. They've been holding that man illegally. The judge picked out the jury. The only case in the whole United States world where the judge picked out the goddamn jury. I was there, and the judge got the most prejudiced damn thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, equal to me. To me, he's kind of a political prisoner. Man. You know, it's just... But, yes, I mean, for what he was what he was busted for, you could walk today without even a problem. He's going to do, he's gonna do his he time. He's, he's going to do his problem. time he on not only what they got him charged with, he's going to do time on what everybody thinks he did. You know what I mean? We don't really have rights, you know, it is America. And like, uh, we believe strongly in what, uh, what this country stands for. And uh, for, for our beliefs in this country, we seem to be getting shot down. <coughs> worked on this movie, it became clear that club members stick real close together. When Richard Nixon's America threw Oakland chapter president Sonny Barger into prison, Sandy started raising money for an appeals fund. He and his fellow New York City members would host a floating concert called the Pirate's Ball. The brothers had met some special people in their travels who now showed up to do their part. Jerry Garcia, Elephant's Memory, and rocker Bo Diddley. Sonny Barger wouldn't be released until four years later, on November 3rd, 1977. Take a whip on me, hey, hey, honey, take a whip on me. Yeah. Tell it to me, boy, tell it to me, drink your corn like a little bean, be, oh, Lord, honey, take a whip 
Days these girls are always out in the street and they couldn't, you know, cook anything, you know, not even boil eggs and shit, you know. I was out in the street worried about what they look like and shit, you know. Hell's Angel woman, you know, she's really something because uh, if she ever left the Hell's Angel, she went with a citizen, man. Let me tell you, that citizen 
It's like, you know, a gift to him that he could get, you know. We are partying here in this Hells Angels boat to join together this man and this woman in a organic wedding, which is the marriage that fits our way of life, as you will see by its definition. Organic, a organic marriage is one between a man of a high rank and a woman of a lesser rank, contracted with the stipulation that neither the wife nor any female offspring of this marriage shall ever inherit or enjoy the rank, title, or property of the husband. Into this, Into this life, together, life together, these persons, these persons come, come to be joined, joined, said to each, each man, man snail, slash, will, will you, you take have this, this woman, woman Wedded wife, love, love and respect. Well, yeah. that to each woman. And will you have this, this hell's angel, angel to be thy wedded husband, husband to, to live, live together in his life, life honoring him, him obeying him, him, polishing his bike, always dutifully devoting yourself to him, unquestioning his every move. For this, for this is your, is your honor. honor to be his as, as long, long as you both shall, shall be. Do you, Kim? With these, what's this say? With these rings, with these rings, I now, I now organically, organically marry you, you in the name of the Hell's Angels, United, United States, States of America. Let's party. <laughs> That's all right, mama. That's all right with you. That's all right, mama. In a way you do, but that's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, mama. In a way you do. My mama told me, Papa done told me too. That guy. She ain't no good to you, but that's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, Mama. big sharp metal things man and swastikas and all that stuff i know for sure that i don't want to fuck with that guy man <laughs> I think you know what right. i mean <laughs> and that's cool because that's telling me that's telling me who he is you know what i mean and i have the choice of i'm either going to go in there and make a fool of myself or else i'm going to be very cool and if if that's what's happening i'll be cool you know but is that out front or what you know are you afraid of them ever sure Sure. Why? Because they're scary, man. You know, they're they're all big, you know, and strong and and good at in in all the violent spaces.
October 1976. In Sacramento, California law enforcement officials are continuing to alert legislators about the dangers of so-called outlaw motorcycle gangs. High on their list were the increasingly notorious Hells Angels, whose alleged involvement in organized crime and violence has made them a major target in the current statewide campaign. That's another subject that always pops up when people start talking about the Hells Angels. Violence, the no bullshit, take care of business kind of violence. From what we've seen, the brothers don't go looking for trouble, but they do have what you might call a reputation, and it attracts more than just the law's attention. It seems that somebody always wants to test themselves against the club. Most learn real fast that they should have minded their own business. You know, people don't realize about us is that when we fight somebody, when we get along with somebody, we hurt them. You know, we just ain't street fighters. We're above that. If you remember in the Cleveland situation, there are approximately, oh, 100, 200 uh, members of a, another motorcycle group called the Breed. Uh, and there are approximately 12, a, 20, I'm sorry, 24 angels attending this show. And apparently, they felt that uh, it was, you know, uh, machismo on their part to take on the angels and um, deliver them a thumping. You know what? The feds, man, they knew they had, it was set and brought up in court. Yeah, they knew that there was a big uh, plan to jump hell's angels. There was about two. 220 for King, motherfuckers, about 25 of us. If we were expecting, you know, somebody coming, we would, you know, hey, we would have made the odds so even, we would have wiped them all out. Still, with 24 Hells Angels there, right? We put 29 of them in the hospital, killed four of them, right? And, you know, they killed one of our brothers, and I'm certain a lot of my brothers were wounded, but you know what? They split. And the interesting thing was that, in my opinion, although we didn't defend out there, that it seemed to me that the, the 10 angels that were arrested had a valid claim of self-defense here. Well, I was right there in the first fucking ranking, I mean, the first echelon, and I, I, I heard this little paranoid mother, I heard this little motherfucker saying, let's go, when he said, let's go, he said, let's go, let's get the fuck out of here. Because we came in telling him, you know what, man, eat us, you know what I mean, motherfucker, you know, we're gonna fuck his up, you know, fuck your faggot. At that time, uh, something came down heavy on one of them's heads, and then we just started stabbing and slapping him, you know what I mean? Out of the 87 arrested, right? Ten were Hell's Angels, the rest were Breed, right? When the police came to that, you know, at the time when, like, uh, the police said, all right, sign the papers, right? And for what reason, you know, the fight this and that. Not one Hell's Angel, not one, uh, pressed charge against the Breed, right? And, like, the Breed pressed charge against us, Come here, right? you know? As the fight was breaking up, it was, it was, it was a priest. It was really, it was really like, like, like one of the rights, you know what I'm saying? Priest with all the black shit all over him. He was kneeling down by this guy doing the guy the last right, you know what I mean? That was as the mace was clear and the cops were chasing everybody out. And at first, they didn't know what was going on. All they knew was there was a bigger, big rumble of dead people laying all over. What happened was the cops put guns were heads and the rest of us for suspicion of they didn't know what. Of course, we was in the paddy wagon. We knew what we were for, you know? You know what? And they killed our brother, Groover, and not one breed was charged with his death. The officers got together after Cleveland because my old man was in jail and they decided to send the girl down and they picked me. Told me to hitch in the city, pick up an angel, and find out what I could. Uh, we we know we're better than that club, you know what I'm saying? We we know we wear our, our clothes all the time, and uh, we're, we're getting to meet these people at any time, you know what I mean? For any kind of any kind of sit down wrestling match, boxing match, you know what I'm saying? Being in training, whatever it is. Well, he wanted me to get Mario to come out to pick, tell Mario I was going to move in with him and have him come out and pick me up, give him a phony address, and ambush him with a machine gun. Was their general idea just to get one of them? You know, they just wanted the information and to lure an angel out in the trap was another big thing. I decided I didn't want any part of that. Yeah, so in love. <laughs> what can you do? You know, and if other people die, I laugh about it. You know, what I mean, death amuses me. But the way I look at it, I'm a bad. I'm bad. There ain't nobody gonna get me. I have no fool around saying they ain't got me. Mm -hmm. Shit, you know. It's... September 1978. California Attorney General Evel Younger is pushing an aggressive campaign for governor based on what he points to as his long-term effort to tackle organized crime, which he says includes such primary militants as the Hells Angels and other outlaw motorcycle gangs. This is a dedication to my bosom friends, my buddies.
buddies, my brothers, or whatever. The Hell's Angels. Do your thing. Baby, do your thing. Do your thing. Baby, do your thing. And if it feels good, do it. Do your thing. like it hasn't changed much since that 4th of July weekend in Hollister decades ago. But now the run is a club tradition that gets everybody together for destinations like Big Bear, Bass Lake, Laconia. You remember that motherfucker, bro? That field? 68, that's where we had the first run, boy. Where are we back to cops off down there? That's the cops and everybody else. There's only, well, I can stay there's only 20 Hells Angels there, and there was over 2,000 outlaw bike clubs invited to that run. You know, we found out who was there. You know, well, not by bull garden people, just by partying with them. You were wrong. Because you don't tell any person they're going to shell out. I know I said that. No, it was my sentiment. That's, my that's, can't get that's, that's what you said. Paranoia is a strange trip. <laughs> I've seen people that could have it together, you know, uh, on the front scene or whatever, but when the chips got fucking deep, man, they turned to buttermilk, you know? You hear about giving shelter? I mean, ow! I mean, you check that moment when he's in. Oh, he got two stab wounds in his side, and one above his ear. The one above his ear went from down here to over here. Anybody else? You want to spend a little time, you know? Have a bear or two. Hey, you know what? We don't want nobody fucking even considered to be a Hells Angel that's going to turn punky or doing anything. That's why we have a lot of hats with other fucking clubs and shit. That's why we pull patches. Like, a lot of people don't understand that. Why don't they go turn somebody's jacket up? Because, like, somebody come by with a patch that looks similar. Red and red on white, whatever, blah, 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 right? They write you a town. They say, wow, they're those Hells Angels write you a town. They might be fucking kicking old ladies and throwing bottles through windows. You know, it's something we don't do. That ain't showing class. To me, showing class is somebody fucking standing in front of a fucking gun and say, go ahead, pull the trigger, but you ain't getting this. That's showing class. It's like those people like the warlocks, you know what? They have no, they half don't even know each other left, you know? Like, no communication whatsoever. This is for real, you know what I mean? The love for the man, individually, and the people on the whole, you know? All the things that you were talking about, is, is it all a code, man, that's all together, or is it just like... Oh, that's loop? right, that's right. A strong code, strongest code in the fucking world, man. The hard times, man, uh, 
You know, you don't never remember the hard times, man, because the good times is so important, man. What's a good time? A good time? It's when you can look around and see your brothers having a good time. You know they call me Master Bo I'm the nastiest man in the land. They say I'm nasty, nasty. I'm a nasty son of a gun. Well, they call me nasty. Oh, diddly. They call me nasty. Throughout the time we've worked on this movie, people have asked us what the Hell's Angels are really like. We tell them that one thing is for sure. There are as many answers to that as there are Hell's Angels. High, cold, moral, right, among ourselves, I mean, you know, like, uh, and total respect for one another. Me and another Hell's Angel stand up 100 people because I know that man's there. Maybe we'll get killed, but you know what? We're going down twice. You know what? Our man, all Hell's Angels are men. You know what? There just ain't many. There just ain't many of that running around. We have the true form of what America is about. Where it is, as far as we're concerned, we are the elite <laughs> of the elite. I do not. I have no trade whatsoever. Except for hell, I I guess that'd be a trade. Come on, Alan. You know, we know you're a rough. But I have no trade. You know, and uh, therefore I will be in jail sooner or later, one way or another. On June 13th, 1979. Federal prosecutors in San Francisco put the final touches on their plans to nail club members on alleged violations of federal racketeering and conspiracy laws. Across the bay, the net was closing as federal, state, and local law enforcement agents armed with riot guns and secret grand jury indictments prepared a massive raid. June 13th, 1979. In an early evening raid, more than 200 federal officers armed with sawed-off shotguns and automatic weapons executed a simultaneous three-state sweep of Hells Angels and Associates. The roundup, which resulted in 22 arrests, began immediately after a secret federal grand jury returned indictments charging club members and associates with violation of federal racketeering influence and corrupt organization laws. Among those arrested was Hell's Angels leader, Ralph Sonny Barker, whose bail was immediately set at $1 million. When this film was almost finished, we discovered that an ex-policeman was willing to discuss the RICO arrests and his former assignment to a secret government finance biker enforcement team, BET. In a suburban Los Angeles television studio where he would attract little attention, 
We asked Scott Barnes about his own background and just exactly what that was all about. My training was uh, originally in military intelligence for the United States Army. And then I was involved in BET, which is the Biker Enforcement Team. BET was organized by the United States government. It started with the Drug Enforcement Administration and included uh, federal treasury agents, counterintelligence FBI agents, organized crime investigators, certain district attorney office organized crime investigators, Evel Younger's uh, OCCIB and CNN Bureau. And it consisted of some very elite, sophisticated uh, intelligence officers and uh, covert operatives. We did various setups, drugs and weapons, and acts of violence against them, and fire bombings, things of that nature. Various law enforcement agencies have been trying to prosecute and get to the organization for many years. And we felt that the only way to get to them now was to destroy the leadership of them and make them fall and do widespread, you know, chaos. They're up early in the morning with their motorcycle and making noise. <laughs> like uh, one day they were going away. And they got up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they left for about a week. And it was so, so uh, quiet, quiet, you know, it's like it you missed them. When they, back, when they came back, everybody ran over there, you know, like to greet them back, you know, because everybody's so used to them, and they're so used to the noise, and they're joking around, they're screaming. And when they left, this block was real silent. Then when they came back, boy, I, I saw so many people, you know, like, hey! <laughs> that came back, you know, like everything went to normal again. I don't know. It was unbelievable. You had to see it to believe it. Uh, before helping anybody else, help your own. And worry about your own. Because this is, this home is first. Come, you know, before anything else, home is first. I tell you something, a lot of people, that you know what, that need us. I mean, people that, people we look out for. He told me, how long you live with 24 years. The head angel, the head angel is bother you. He don't bother me. Why your name? Why your name? Juan E. Guzman. Okay, sign and sign my name. It's okay. He tried to get the name of the whole Spanish people over here about the head angels he bothered me. But nobody can sign and say something different because the head angel. He helped every, the Spanish people. They help. Because somebody's going to try to rob and uh, uh, call the head angel. The head angel will hit it right away. Little well, psycho wants to go for a ride. Come on. Take the ride, Bert? Yeah. You want to go on the bike? Oh, he knows how to do it. Tell him to give it gas, bro. Let's see if he knows how to throw it. I'll be scrupulous with you. If I wasn't Vinny's father, I'd think it's uh, you know, a bunch of screwballs. <laughs> but being Vinny's father, I can't think that way. But, however, uh, as uh, much as they look like they uh, robbed uh, for no good, they, they can do more good than harm. There's no crime to be committed around here, which is good. What is that? They uh, demand a lot of respect. Hey, Bert! They're all their own. I mean, if I was, you know, that's what I think. But I mean, but uh, I don't like to say nothing because I feel that I'm uh, being partial because I have a son. One thing I like about him, none of them are on dope, you know. September 1st, 1979. Workmen are putting the final touches on a Hells Angels courtroom that has been specially remodeled to seal off spectators with bulletproof plexiglass walls. Presiding over the upcoming trial will be Federal District Judge Samuel Conti, who has a reputation as a strict law and order advocate. You know, I treat them, they're just big babies. You know, that's the way I treat them. And, and they're just, that's, they're, they're nice guys, but they, they can be a tough bunch of bastards. Don't, don't get me wrong. The hell do they think they are? Yesterday they were going like hell with fireworks. Nobody yeah. came over here to do anything. 
fireworks uh, is going all over, all over New York City. Well, I'm sorry. Not only on East 30. It just came over the radio. It's illegal now. Uh, it's been illegal for how many No, 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 no. Now it's a real arrest. Uh, like this is a new one today by the mayor. Well, I guarantee it. You ain't going to run nothing over here, buddy, because you'll go to jail for it. All right, everything's over with, right? No, it's not over yet. Every goddamn time they do this. Can't hope the music up wants to be a friend of theirs? I'll stop this nonsense. Get the reporters down here. Let's see, Inspector. I got Roger. Jack White. You look good, sir. How's it going? Good, good. Complaints on your uh, festivity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what's right? Tell my independence day. This <laughs> one's uh, complaining about that the barbecue is going to be up front next to the, the smoke go through his window. He's allergic to the smoke. So we got. So they're going to keep the uh, barbecue in the back. And uh, let me know. Come on home and then it's all over in the back. I want to see. Come in. Just come over here, sir. Yes, sir. Tell this guy I'll have there. a heart attack, you know. Seriously. Where's there's an old guy, you know? Yeah. That's you. Uh, they had this thing over here again. And then over here, the smoke came in here. And then I had to call the fire alarm, and then I was laying unconscious on the floor. And and smoke. Had, yeah. Then they had to break into my door, and I had to get two new locks for $50, which nobody gave me back. I have no idea. Yeah, he's talking about that. Was it? You guys got a ring on that. <laughs> <laughs> so there, was a, there were Irish wedding rings, like, you know, oh, yeah. there, centuries ago. He was over there talking to them and, and smoking a cigarette in his uniform. He's a lot of smoke. In his uniform and on the street. This is something okay. new. Oh, oh what's that? Yeah, skinheads. Yeah. Yeah, and they, and they started in. There was a busload of people from Ulster that came yeah, down. Yeah. Well, they don't do anything. They just hang around. They shave their heads, but now the hair's starting to grow. So now they wear the trousers like up like this and wear leather jackets. Look, look, so. look, right, look, I'm just telling you, if something happens to me, these are the people that are responsible. I'll make sure of that. Now, this is going to be removed right now. Mm -hmm. This year. You understand? We're going to take that in the back. They're going to take that down and move it to the back. Okay, Mr. Lee. Take care. The place was rocking so fine A oh, oh, funky smell of perfume and wine The band was cooking real good Then I turned around to the very good Down stone and fastened his eyes He got me singing, I was hypnotized And when well, my show was done He took my number and began to run Go, 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 Yeah.
I got blisters. I got blisters on the brain. This one is fucking hot. I got blisters popping all over my motherfucker. October 4th, 1979. The federal court trial of Hells Angels Motorcycle Club members got underway today in an arena of strict security. U.S. Attorney G. William Hunter and Assistant U.S. Attorney Robert E. Dondero have told reporters that the government will attempt to prove that the motorcycle club operates an extensive and highly profitable drug business. The Hells Angels is an organization, a group of people that get together to ride motorcycles and have fun, go to parties and do whatever. Now, because... It's whatever that may be the problem. Well, but, but what I'm just getting at is because certain people in the Hells Angels have committed crimes in the past does not make the organization a criminal organization. No more. We asked Barnes just how much power Bet really had. Bet had, had no limits in the aspect that we had a free hand financially and intelligence-wise to do anything we wanted to with two or more people's approval, myself and let's say one other or another agent. And I felt they, they put into you enough that they're bad guys. We have to get rid of them at any cost. And so therefore everything's okay. And, you know, don't worry about any of the wiretappings or the drug setups or the weapon setups. So I felt that if we had to get them, we had to get them. You can hype somebody and you pump them up so much. I mean, you gotta remember, a lot of the guys are using drugs. I mean, you know, you start doing a lot of crank and a lot of toot, you know, you start to lose touch with reality eventually. I mean, here's this guy, he's supposed to be good, he's got a badge, he's got long hair and a beard, and he carries, you know, a 357 Magnum and a sawed-off shotgun. He says, hey, I have the right to take a human life, you know. I mean, the guy gets all psyched up. He sees some angel, you know, cruising down the highway, decides, let's get him. He's an angel. We're right, we're a secret little group. They don't know, my watch commander doesn't know, nobody knows. You know, we're really secret, you know, and we're high up. So therefore, we got to keep our camaraderie, our brotherhood together, you know, and we're the ones. You we're in the front lines. They're not, and they don't know about us. The Hells Angels have quite a mixed reputation, with a lot of people seeing them as racists. We asked Sandy if this was true of the club. Some of us are prejudiced, you know, but myself, like, I grew up with a lot of black people, you know, but I believe deeply that you judge a man by his behavior, not his color. The new niggas of the world are the bike riders. They're getting all the tickets and all they're yeah. asking. That's, that's fact. We are the we are the minority race. Yeah. Uh, only blacks can realize what I'm talking about. You know, uh, when you say uh, a nigger is a nigger. A well, nigger, to me, is what people consider the lowest thing on earth. That's what people look at you as. A nigger, well, look at a nigger. Low down, no good dog. But well, look at this, this is like that. And for real, even niggers look at us like that. If they would spend as much time and as much energy at, blame, at being a plain, uh, ordinary black as they spend time being uh, a nigger, people would be more ready to accept them. Have you ever noticed all our clubhouses are right in the, in the darker section of town? Have you noticed that? Does that seem strange? I mean, really, you think about it. I don't know of any clubhouse anywhere. Seems, seems as though they're uh, unnaturally attracted to us. <laughs> they start out white, and uh, the niggers just seem to flock to us. Uh, I can't understand it. We had, we had another clubhouse in town. They condemned it. They said, uh, it, boy, it was right smack in the middle of them. I mean, right there in it, you know. They condemned it, so we'd have to move out. We had some good times. Uh, like Oreo cookies. I'm telling you, with a big, thick, white center. Right. <laughs> November 29th, 1979. Jurors in the ongoing Hells Angels racketeering trial today heard testimony from key prosecution witness Thomas Big Red Bryant. A former Hells Angel, Bryant has been provided immunity from prosecution himself. Defense attorneys are attempting to find out whether Bryant has been paid for his appearance at the controversial trial. Many of them have these swastikas, SS, the Heimischer Staats Polizei, as they say, and then all sorts of outlandish insignia on their jacket. This is an SS patch. It's an original one. It was a gift from a brother. And it's got a lot of bearing. It was a gift. You know, what it meant at the time, it was the, the elite of its core. In no way can I see us 
relating to what happened in, in Germany uh, during the Second World War. You know, you say we're fascistic, we're uh, uh, anti-Semitic or whatever. Well, uh, I guess I'm the proof that we ain't. You know, because uh, I'm Jewish and I sure ain't a fascist and I sure ain't anti-Semitic because I don't hate myself, you know? Or my brother. You know, I don't give a damn what it means as long as a brother gives it to yeah, me, I want to wear it. My brother's wearing it and I said, shit tower. <laughs> and they had to open his patch and show me W I and it. W-H-I-T. So it's white power. Okay. Yeah, that's where it belongs anyway. Yeah, well, but what's that got to do with a swastika? Don't fuck up, will you? I can't hey, wait. It, it started a long time ago. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah? <laughs> then it would say German power, wouldn't it? No. White oh, is right. Watch out, here comes. <laughs> here comes Bill Hiccup. Might be beautiful, but motherfucker red is way ahead. Right? I don't see why we can't all live in this society. But let's, let's quit trying to cram each other down each other's throats and, and, and trying to make us accept things that, that we don't want to accept, you know? My, my first reaction was, well, you know, these are, are uh, potential Nazis, little fascists. But it's not true. You show us respect, you get treated with respect. You act like an asshole, you get treated like an asshole. As far as what my uh, religious beliefs are, my religious beliefs are Hell's Angels. That's my, that's my religion, my, my way of life, my profession, everything. Bill was a special gift to us, man. Little Bill was a magician. He, uh, he, he was, it seemed like he was just too pure for this world. He stood up for himself. The guy wound up fighting three guys who had a, who had a heart on him for him. He jumped off his bike and he fought these guys instead of running. And they got so scared behind it that they shot him in the head. He threw his head off because they just, you know, they, they couldn't face that this guy, they beat him down and they couldn't beat his spirit and he was taken away from us by some slime some fucking low life damn hell angel as he was he was gonna find a man he was 
very proud man. He never lied. It's a shame. We lost a brother. A lot of us didn't really get to have time to get to know him. Brother for a short time. But he's been a hell's angel all his life. And that's just the way he felt. July 2nd, 1980. The federal government's year-long effort to destroy the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club collapsed today when jurors were unable to reach a verdict in the nine-month, multi-million dollar trial. Leader Sonny Barger and other club members were acquitted of racketeering charges, but government attorneys pledged they will retry the case once again. Looks like the case is falling apart. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to say. There's a lot of people still over there. They need to get out there. You know, it's been 14 months and they haven't proved a damn thing. And uh, they're not gonna. I think everybody in the jury room felt that the government witnesses were, uh, were rather uh, despicable or beneath contempt, actually. August 6th, 1980. Charges of conspiracy against Sonny Barger and his wife Sharon were dismissed today in what prosecutors call the best interests of justice. Racketeering and conspiracy charges against 10 other defendants in the trial were also dismissed. But federal attorneys are preparing to launch yet another prosecution of the remaining club members. Under the RICO law, the efforts of the government were to take a high-profile group such as the Hells Angels, a group that has notoriety, and use the RICO law to make bad law in the future. It, the RICO law, as used in this particular case, uh, generated abuses of search warrants where the government went into homes looking for, quote, indicia, unquote, of membership in the Hells Angels. Well, I was sitting home all alone watching my TV. Trying to think of all the places I'd rather be. So I turned off Roy Rod, I went downstairs and got my car. Headed right on down to the local bar, where I had a scotch and soda, a couple of six packs and some wine. Some good old Southern comfort, and I was really feeling fine. I had a dry martini, snort of brandy that was on the house. Sitting the there watching all the good. other food get south. I was getting too bad to boogie. This is a new man. The Bowery. Too bad to boogie. Too bad to boogie. If I ever ride with a club again, well, I let go of the air. I kept my head to see if I could see. to the Hells Angels party downtown. Then out of a clear blue sky, a fucking pirate with black hair and a black beard 
spun me around, and boom! Right across the top of my head. And I fortunately survived the whole thing due to one reason. I'm an Irishman. Later in the interview, Barnes revealed why he decided to go public and leave Bet. I left Bet uh, after several killings had taken place because of Bet operations. And uh, I'd become a Christian and decided that I was going to leave. And uh, the government says, make sure everything is destroyed. All your tapes, your wiretaps, the photos, everything. And they set me up in business in Northern California. And then my house burnt down and all the evidence they thought was destroyed. And I knew that they were after me. So therefore, I decided to let the truth be known. I had been following the trials. And they had kept me as a you know, secret informant in, in the back of all their paperwork. So I came forward and brought all the evidence with me and took trial. October 14, 1980. Under the eye of federal judge William Oreck, the second racketeering trial of Hells Angels members got underway in San Francisco today. The USA always had a fear that either I would come forward, one of the other agents that was deeply involved would come forward and tell the truth. The truth would be that it was a conspiracy with law enforcement agents to, in fact, use clandestine covert illegal means to destroy the Hells Angels at any cost. January 12, 1981. Hells Angels defense attorneys today called for the admission of testimony from ex-policeman Scott Barnes. A former undercover officer, Barnes has told lawyers and reporters that he once served on a government-organized and financed biker enforcement team. One of the things that amazed all the attorneys who worked on the Hells Angels trial was the government infiltration of the Hells Angels over the years, dating back from a, approximately 1965, going all the way through the present day, as far as we know. You know, what, one of the things that's amazing about it, here are people that, 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 that seem to be outlaws to our society who show a tremendous loyalty towards the government of the United States are willing to, to lay down their lives in defense of the government of the United States, regardless of who's in, the, in power. Uh, Sonny volunteered as the Gorgia man. Uh, 1965 wrote a letter and it was refused, never even answered. We didn't have the courtesy to answer his letter. Uh, he volunteered uh, a sick guerrilla team to go over there and take care of business. <laughs> it was beautiful, you know? And like, uh, you know, and I got told, right, that it would have made us too strong in the people's eyes. That I can't understand is because, you know what, we're Americans. And you know what, like whatever anybody says about us, you know, we know what's right, right? And like, uh, we chose our life, and we don't snivel. And all we wanted to do is show, you know, like, you know, when, when one of our brothers goes to jail, but we, we, we don't want any, we don't forget. And you know what, and like if an American goes to war, and he gets caught in a prisoner war camp, right? We don't want nobody else to forget him either, right? Because he's an American too, you know? This country is in such a paranoid extreme. Every Organi organization, every group is so fucking afraid of every other group. You got the CIA afraid of the FBI, the FBI watching the CIA. Every politician is looking at every other politician. It's, it's like, it's just about the perfect uh, uh, chance for communism to keep creeping and creeping into this country by breeding distrust amongst Americans. That's how they took over every other country. And if we don't get our shit together, that's what's going to happen here. I'm just wondering if they uh, would, would give up the, 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 the mode of dress and riding around in uh, motorcycles and so on, whether or not they wouldn't uh, be uh, respected members of the Republican Party or Conservative Party. I'm Probably not kidding. They would. Because their philosophy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what government ought to be and so on is really uh, uh, almost right-wing in that respect. It's not fascist. I'm not saying it's fascist. I would say gold, a Goldwater uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. branch yeah. of the Republican Party. I, I would say that if Goldwater ran for president, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if down deep in their heart they wouldn't support him. I, I believe in this country and uh, needs a lot of work. You know, uh, Watergate's an uh, example. But uh, basically, I think that this is the only system that we can exist in in the world today. I'd have to support it. Two years after that interview, Fu Griffin was released from Folsom. He got together with Hell's Angel Deacon Proudfoot to start a country and western concert promotion business named in memory of their dead brother, Charlie Magoo. 
Willie Nelson was a Magoo attraction before he earned superstar status, and he's been faithful to Pooh and Deacon ever since. Take back the weed, take back the cocaine, baby. Take back the pills, take back the whiskey, too. Don't need it now, your love was all I was after. I'll make it now, cause I can get off on you. Take back the weed, take back the cocaine, baby. Take back the pills and take back the whiskey, too. Don't need it now, your love was all I was after. I'll make it now, cause I can get off on you. Who'd ever thought this was something that I'd ever do? So you can take back the wheat, take back the cocaine, baby. Take back the pills and take back the whiskey, too. Don't need it now, your love was all I was after. I'll make it now, cause I can get off on you. I'll make it now, cause I can get off on you. February 25th, 1981. A second conspiracy and racketeering trial against Hells Angels members ended today after jurors reported they were hopelessly deadlocked. U.S. Attorney G. William Hunter told reporters that he would not seek a third trial after noting that the interests of justice had been served in what observers say is the longest and most expensive federal prosecution in history. You know, it was nine to three both times uh, for acquittal and... Uh... It just shows that they didn't have a case. It was really lousy. All right, we're talking about $10 million of the taxpayers' money. <laughs> talking about a series of paid informers. I think under the circumstances, we did what we thought was right. And I have no, uh, I have no regret for having done that. I mean, if we waited for, for the next rape to come up, the next scheduled rape, or the next scheduled alamont, where we're gonna, we all got together and decided to go knife a nigger, um, just because he happened to be shooting at us, uh, it'd be pretty boring. I mean, you'd have to be pretty patient. And, uh, we're not notoriously patient. But they either have to put up with us or kill us. Because they can't ship us anywhere. Nowhere else will take us. <laughs> and uh, they goddamn sure can't talk us into quitting. Shoot us or get used to it. If you decide to shoot us, you better get everybody in the first shot. That's right. They shoot one and they've got 10,000 shots coming back at them. So they better be ready to fight if they start to try to... Tell us there ain't gonna be no Hells Angels. They better get it on. <laughs> they ain't getting my gun until they pry it out of my cold, dead fingers. I ain't taking my patch off until they uh, take it off my uh, body. You know what I mean? Despite the failure of the RICO prosecutions to crush the Hells Angels, Barnes left us with the impression that some form of clandestine operation against the club would continue. We asked him just exactly what he meant. I think, I, I don't think it'll be with guns. I think it'll be with car accidents, with uh, accidental drownings, maybe. You know, they're going to do it a more sophisticated, more in-depth intelligence. You know, let's say to find out this guy's going to be riding his chopper, you know, through this, you know, park or whatever. Find out something that's pretty solid. Set him up for an accident, you know. Well, look at a motherfucking bomb, though. You know, when I was in the Marines, I seen a motherfucking bomb like that. No shit, man. Like an infrared thing, you know, you aiming at people, man. Like right now, there could be some dude aiming at us, you know, on an infrared. You never know, man. 
Oh, he's here, man. A little gunshot, and that's it, man. Drop the pump. If you had not a fall up, and I would not have found you. Angel flying too close to the ground. The pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do and doing it with the people that you love. That's all right, Mama. That's all right with you. That's all right, Mama. In a way you do, but that's all right. That's all right. That's all right now, Mama. Any way you do. My mama told me, Papa done told me too. That guy you're fooling with, she ain't no good to you, but that's all right. 